So take your Bible this morning now and turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John in chapter 8. I am so glad in verse 12, John chapter 8 and verse 12, I am so glad that you got out of the bed and you came to the house of the Lord. Those of you that didn't listen to your flesh and when it was raining, like, I can watch it online, I'm glad that, that you came. Those of you that made plans all week long to be here, thank you you came. Those of you just all of a sudden came now, thank you for coming and being in the house of God and those who are watching together. What we're doing in the month of December together, we are looking at the Gospel of John and the great passages that teach us who Jesus is. You see, the truth about Christmas often is overlooked because we have all the stories and all the tinsel and all the events that we have to do, and we hear part of it, but we don't hear the whole story. So what we've been doing, we found out last week that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Not the light of the world, but He is the one who gives living water. And then we discover that He's the bread of life, and today that He is the light of the world. Look on the screen with me today. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus says this, and I quote, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying these words, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Question, has there ever been a day when that you experienced this truth? You say, Pastor, what do you mean? The truth is that many people know about God, but they don't necessarily know God. Now, I can tell already by the way that the enemy is fighting me in this moment that, that, that he knows that somebody's about to come to the light. He knows that somebody today is in the light, but there's something that's in your life that's been kind of dark. It happened in the first service that God revealed something to somebody after many years, and they dealt with it and got liberty. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? J.I. Packer, the great theologian, put it this way about God. He said this, and I quote, There is a grave difference between knowing God and knowing about God. Those who know God, he said this, there are three things about your life. You'll have energy to serve Him. You'll also have this boldness to share Him, and you also will have contentment in Him. I was listening to David Jeremiah on Tuesday night as he was up in New York, and he said this in the sermon. He said this, that Christ came to this earth, and the news of Christmas tells us two things, he said. That Christ came to watch this to be one of us. We know that. But also this, He came because He is for us. How many of you know God's for you? God is for you. But the, I added something to the sermon. I know you do that with me sometimes, and more often than not, you take away from the sermon, like, get out of here. But listen to this. I added this. God who came because He loves you, and the God who came to be one of you, also came to do a work in you. And unless He's in you, He cannot do a work for you. And so here's the deal today. Jesus is going to shine His light in our lives so that He can do a greater work. Because here's the thing. If you have evil in your heart, if you have darkness in your life, that cannot coexist at the same time with the light. So God has to do some things. You say, explain that to me. Phil Robb is the founder of Duck Dynasty. Some of you saw his movie recently called The Blind. And you ought to see it if you haven't. Here's what he said. When I gave my life to Jesus... I received one of the rarest commodities in the world on that day. I got peace. How many of you did? But he went on, Brother Howard, to say this. He shared this at a message I heard him preach at Gateway Church. He said this, For the first 28 years of my life, I lived in darkness, and I carried on like a crazy man. But then I met Jesus. Now listen to this. And for the last 42 years, I've lived as a man of peace who's been blessed beyond measure. So if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you can say that the light has come into your life. But let me ask you, how are you handling the light? Say, what do you mean? How are you working in that light? Are you in full light? Are you in small light? Are you in a little light? Now lean in with me now. I didn't share this in the first sermon. Lean in with me. Some of you are living saying you know Christ, but there's no batteries in you. There's not the light. Some of you have the light, but you've, you've, you've not recharged in a while. And because of that, in your life right now, you've not recharged in the Word and in the Spirit. So you come here today. I hate to use this terminology because some of you use it in the wrong way. You're half lit. Now, not being drunk, but you're half lit for Jesus. But God wants you. Some of you go home and say, he said to be half light. I did not say that. Howard, I did not say that. Now watch as we come down the path. Jesus, on this day in his life, having ministered, stood in a crowd of people, and he said, I am the light of the world. Now, if you don't know Christ today, I, I understand you can't have a clue what I'm talking about. Your life is like this. You're existing. You're barren. You're empty spiritually. There's no happiness in your life. You come to Christmas time and it gets worse, worse as one author said, because the holidays pulled off the Band-Aid, doesn't it? 
And it reveals the truth that you can't solve relationships. It reveals the truth that there's something missing in your life. And you just kind of hope that you get through it. Well, I'm here today to tell you that God loves you so much that He said, I am the light of the world. Only two simple things I want to do with you today, and we'll go on home together. Hopefully God has moved in our light, and the light will come and be forever changed in your life. I want to explain the lie of the world from Scripture, and then I want to give you an example. I want to explain it from Scripture, and I want to give you an example. So look back in your Bible a second time to chapter 8 and verse 12, and it says, again, Jesus spoke. The word again in the Scripture, always whenever you see it, or the word the, or after, or, and behold, you see that it's always, it's always a connecting word. And it means this, that you'd better pay attention to what came before it, because if he says it again, you may not get it the second time if you didn't hear it the first time. Am I telling the truth? So here's the scene. The scene started in chapter 7. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Three times a year, the Jewish men were told to go to Jerusalem, all the way back from the time of the Old Testament. Three feasts. They would go and spend three times together. Some of them were one day, two of them were seven days. And this was a seven-day feast, and they were to go, and as they were to go, they were to go for a purpose, and the purpose was, was to remember what God had done when He was their light. When he brought them out of Egypt in Exodus 14, he took them across the Red Sea, and as they began to move, there was this cloud that came over them by day, as a pillar of a cloud, and at night it turned to look like fire, so it lighted their way. And for centuries he had been doing that, and Leviticus 22 says that they were to take palm branches or other type of branches, and they were to build tents. Their tents, and here's what would happen in Jerusalem, which would have 30 to 50,000 people. On times of feast, it would swell to 100 or 150,000 people. And if you lived in the city, here's what you were supposed to do you're to go up on top of your house and put a tent. Everybody ever do that? Our family used to tent. I mean, we were big campers. We'd go right out in our backyard and put a tent. So, y'all not, y'all life in anything in this service. We'd put a tent because I didn't want to go all the way out somewhere and one of them get scared in the middle of the night and one of them say, I want to go to the bathroom because Sherry wouldn't let the men go outside. You know what I'm talking about. And so we'd go in the backyard for one night and have a camp out, but they would do it for seven days. And by the way, they had no cell phone. They had, in those days, they were not to work. And here's what they would sit around and do, talk about what God had done. I said this in the first service, you need places in your life where that you can refresh, that you can become renewed in your walk with God, and here's the problem, God has given you a way to do it, but you seldom do it because you're so busy. And you say, what is it? He's called you to be in His church every week. When you come to the house of God, we're going to give you the Word of God and the power of the Spirit of God. You're going to get fellowship. We're going to do all six core values when we come together. We are, we're going to give the Word. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to fellowship as family. We're going to do service and mission. And we're going to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you only come one out of three, one out of four, or if you come in like this, like he's got to get me through, there is no time of blessing that can come. And so what they would do three times a year, they would gather together, and on this time, they would spend an entire week fellowshipping together. So just imagine thousands upon thousands of people crowded into the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible teaches us that on the first day of the feast, what they would do is this, that they would light the menorah, these big candles. And these candles would shine. They were told by history that they actually, for 100 miles away at night, Brother Roger, can you imagine that? For 100 miles away at night, you could see the light coming from the city of Jerusalem. On the first day, they would take water, the priest would, and he would pour it out reminding them that God had provided water from a rock in those years that they were wandering from the desert. And so Jesus saw all that, was a part of all that, taught all that, but at the end of the seventh day, on the seventh day, they would do this. The priest would stand again, and he would pour out the water. And he'd pronounce a blessing that God's water of life would be upon them. Look with me in chapter 7. Now we're in the message. The Spirit's going out directing our lives in verse 37. Chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, now think about this. If anyone is thirsty, the Bible says, listen to this, let him come and drink. So they'd been there for a week. Imagine this now. They'd seen all this scene. They were remembering what God had done. They kind of got back in the right way. And the Bible says, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now watch, they would get refreshed in God. So is he your light? The Scripture says here in verse 39, now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
So the Holy Spirit was going to come, and he was prophesying about that day, and so it's come to us now. So think about what Jesus is teaching. And in this moment, they began to question him, and the day ended. What you don't know, it does not tell you in Scripture, but when the last day of the feast was done, they would come and they would put out that candelabra. Seven days, the beauty of the light was so wonderful, and then all of a sudden it was extinguished. I want you to notice today as the lights begin to go down in the service at this point. These guys are going to turn the lights down for you a little bit. You say, well, what in the world are you doing this for? I want you to get the picture. I want you to get the picture. They came down. There was the great hoopla like it was last Sunday night. It was a great time together. But then Monday came, didn't it? How many times do you just, you just have a moment and then the, the next day comes? And you see, by the way, we live more days sadly like this than we do with the brightness of where I'm standing. And that's so sad. So Jesus of the Bible says, chapter 8 and verse 1, that when they left, he went to the Mount of Olives, spent the night with the Lord praying, and in verse 1, he came back to the temple. And the Bible says they gathered to him those who came that day. So you've come today, thank you. And they gathered around Jesus, and he began to teach. And he said, I am the light of the world. Now think about that for just a moment. What in the world was he saying? Well, we know this. Later he would say, as it comes on the screen for you, he will say in John 12, he'll say to the crowd gathered there around him, I have come into the world as a light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in what? Here's what I'm afraid with many of you. I've seen it so long in these years of being a pastor is that you come to know Jesus Christ and you're so happy for that and you should be. You get baptized but when you go home and you come to church for a while and you're in love with that, but then God begins to shine a light in an area of your life that's a stronghold. Am I right? You make a decision. Either you come into the light and give it to God or you keep carrying it. You argue with God and you say, God, it's not that bad. And then what ends up happening is that you live your life. Isn't it so sad that there's as many people who are saved who go to a psychiatrist for counseling as those who are lost? Isn't it sad that as many go through divorce that are saved as those that are lost? Isn't it as many that some of us go through our entire lives with so much dysfunction in us, and we say this, we tell a lost and dying world, I have come, Jesus come to be the light, and people look at us and they say, well, if he's the light, then why is there darkness? You see, I'm not preaching right now, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you as a brother who loves you, as a shepherd who wants to shepherd you and fulfill 2 Timothy 4. I, I love you with all my heart. But Jesus said here, he said, I am the light and whoever follows me. See, they would have grasped that because they still understood the Old Testament. The Bible says, for example, in Psalm 27 and 1, the Bible says that God was coming and he would be the light. The Bible says that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 49 and verse 6 that he would be a light to the Gentiles. And so they knew when he came that he'd be a great light. We know this, that someday in heaven, in Revelation 21, when God returns and sets up the new kingdom, there will not be a sun, moon, or stars. They won't have to be because Jesus will be the light. But think about this. You say, well, now tell me now today, Keith, why is there such darkness in the world? It wasn't always that way. Genesis 1, 3, and 4, the Bible says that God said, let there be light, and there was light. There was the lesser light. There was the sun and the moon, wasn't it? There were the stars, and so they continue today. But then the Bible says that Adam and Eve walked away from God, and the light of Christ, they were now out of fellowship and relationship with God. So the darkness came, and Jesus promised through, through God the Father, Genesis 3 and 15, I'll come to be the light. And so thousands of years of darkness has come and gone. But Jesus has promised to be the light of the world. And I want to tell you this day with all my heart, there's a path you have to walk before Jesus can be your light. First of all, you have to be touched as it comes on the screen. You have to be touched by Jesus. It says, whosoever, whosoever follows me. You will not follow somebody unless you see there's a need to follow them. Is it true? For example, if the light goes off, and, and one guy has the flashlight, no matter if he's a Republican, a Democrat, a Georgia fan, a Georgia Tech fan, or even a Kentucky fan, you're going to go to the light because he's got the light. And here's the problem. In their day, there was not the light. And here's the problem in us maybe today, is that the whosoever is following a crowd of whosoever's who are still in the darkness. And so Jesus says, you need to, you need to be touched by me, but you also need to turn and follow me. He says, whoever turns and, and follows me will not walk in the darkness, 
You see, thirdly, you have to, you have to walk a, a different path in life. And the problem is, is that people are in the darkness. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-9 through 9 says this, that false teachers will come, and when they teach, they will teach a lie. And they'll get a following after them so that they will trickle their ears, 2 Timothy 4 and 4. It's because they, they know that's the only way they're going to get a crowd. And friend, we're not trying to get a crowd here. You know what we're trying to do is see people redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you have been fooled into believing that when we, cor- when we speak words that need to correct your life, you're thinking we're against you. But the truth of the matter is because we love you. It's because we want you to live this life. I am not who I was intended to be by my flesh or the devil, but I am who I am because God's brought me into the light. And friend, today, you know what? Many of you are looking for the answer, and the answer is really Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, listen to me, He is the water that brings life. He is the bread that gives life. He is the light of the world. But you cannot take it as that you just get baptized and join a church, and that's all you need to do. You have to get in the light. You have to let him have every part of your life. He did that with me this morning. I'll share more about that later. And so I want to tell you that God says through his word, when you turn and follow me, you say, say more about that. Well, look down to verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, because many of them did that day. He said, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you have prayed for a long time that you want to be in the light, but you gave up? Or you come out for a week or two and you go right back. You just end up right back in that same cycle. You know why? It's because you're not fully lit. You haven't handed it over to him. You say, well, I'm not. It's, it's really not an addiction, Pastor. Sin is an addiction. And until the day I die, I'm going to have to battle that addiction in my life to overcome it every day. You see, some of you will say like that. They said to him, we're the offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you'll become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly. I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Any sin practitioners in the room? Kind of one or two of us like, yes. You know, so you know what a sin practitioner is? Somebody who does it every day. For example, how many of you drive 10 miles over the speed limit? Don't lie. You are sinning every day. Now, don't start arguing about it. You've, you've accepted it, and someday you will stand before God. Now, on the opposite side, how many of you drive 10 miles on the speed limit? You cause me to sin every day. <laughs> Amen, Brother Howard? Get it up there. That's the, that's, it's the limit. So what makes you at 65 and a 55 any different than an adulterer who sleeps around on their spouse? Now, preacher, that's not the same thing. God weighs it different. What Bible are you reading? When I figured this out in my life, my brother, Brother Alex, I love you, my brother. When I figured that out in my life, I quit doing this and looking on Facebook and pointing out people's problems. I quit pulling in Wendy's if they only got one worker and telling them how to do their job. I, I, I quit in my, I, I've quit in my life. I, the older I get, the less opinions I have. You see, when the light of the world comes in you, God begins to work in you. This is what Jesus says here. He says this, The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son does. So if the son sets you free, then you're free indeed. This Christmas, let God free you by coming into light and sing what Pastor Rick sings around here sometimes. Lord, do whatever you want to do. If we, particularly, listen to me, all all of you that are big thinkers in this room, if you would quit trying to better someone else. I'm just saying this in love because I get weird. People are always telling me how to do it better, how to do it different. I read the Bible too. And as I read major sections of it, God confronts me and says, Keith, do better. Now listen, I want wisdom. Proverbs says that. And please bring me your wisdom. When you bring me the Word of God, I bring it to, I, you know, I want that wisdom. I don't think I'm saying, don't ever come to me. I, I want wisdom. But I don't want your opinion. And you don't want my opinion. If you'll get in the light, watch this, your dysfunction can be gone. When you get in the light, you'll start, dads, first of all, you'll love your kids in the right way and they'll start listening to you. Mom, get in the light so that, that, that your family will be as such that they'll see you as a servant. 
I want to become a young person. I want to become a person that when you are with me, that you're saying, this man is worthy of me listening to because he's in the light. America needs a generation of people to be in the light. I don't know if that's a good explanation, but that's what the Bible says. So let me give you an example and we're through. In this setting, back in the temple, the lights are down. We've gotten used to them now, haven't we? And I want to bring them down lower than that, but with our TV and all that we do, it's all. We, I, I wish I could have gotten it just absolutely just black. There's where Jesus was in that moment. If you go back to verse 2, early in the morning he came again to the temple, and the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and they placed them in her midst. Now, did you get this? The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman. Now, this woman had been caught. Literally, they had gone to her, found her. I don't know if she was in the act or if it was before or after, but they caught her. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like that you were just overwhelmed and got caught in your sin and you just don't know what to do about it? And here's what's the problem with it. If you get in the wrong crowd of people... They're going, to treat, they're going to treat you in a way that's going to, you're going to say, you know what, I don't want to be anything to do with God. But God will always treat you in a loving, redeeming way. The Bible said it was scribes. Scribes and Pharisees. Scribes were people, according to the Bible, who had the responsibility to protect the law of God, the Word of God. You see it in Ezra's day, in the book of Ezra, as we read again this morning in Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Ezra stood in front of the people, and he read the Word of God for four hours, and the Bible said they stood there, and they were overwhelmed, and for the next four hours they repented. You see, they were godly people, but because the light went down and because the world had changed and they wanted to get along with Rome, they were politically motivated, they changed their views. They added to God's Word. And then the Pharisees were their partners. I mean, the Pharisees would take the Word that they were carrying and that they were protecting, and they would open the scroll, and the Pharisee would read it, people like Nicodemus in John 3, and they had bought in too that we just got to get along, we, we got to keep this machine moving. And so you had a group of Sunday school teachers and a group of pastors who were given anything but the Word of God, and everybody was feeling good about themselves. But in this moment, because the light of the world had come, they had to shut him down. So they went and found probably, Brother Don, the first prostitute they could find, or the woman in adultery, and they brought her in, and they threw her down in front of Jesus. And I am sure last Saturday, as I spoke the Word of God, that that precious lady thought I was doing the same thing to her. No doubt. There's no doubt she thought that because she did not know me. All she was, was she, the light hit her in the eyes. And you know this, that if you, you've not been in the light and, you, and the light hits you, what's the first thing? You're going to do this. Here was this woman. And the Bible says here that they said to him in verse 4, Teacher, this woman has been called an act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to, to stone such women. So what do you say? you like, did I just read that? Deuteronomy says in the second given of the law that Moses said that if someone comes into your midst and they commit adultery, that you are to stone them. And not because they wanted to kill everybody, because it was so foreign, it was such a sin, that if you would take that radical step, that no one else would see this and do this. See, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ anymore, we don't discipline, do we? We do here. If a pastor has an affair, next weekend he won't be in the pulpit. Do you know that? We won't throw him away. We will not. We'll do our best to recover he and his wife. It's too important to us. But for a long period of time, we'll have him away in a position to work. If, if, he, gets on, if he gets on alcohol, we're not going to throw him away. Now, some of you may differ with me because, listen, what makes him different than you? So, well, he's a pastor. He's higher accountable. Absolutely. But we're not going to throw him away. Man, God's working right here because I, I didn't have any of this. Dan, help me. Pray for me, right? Sincerely. He's uh, talking to somebody in this room. Many of you are choosing other things. And we look at everybody else like, you know what? If you'd be like me, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a scribe. And I don't want to be like that woman in that moment of her life. And so Jesus responded. He, he, you know what he, did? He, he did not say anything about that circumstance because if, if he had said stoner, the Romans would have killed him. If he'd said, let her go, the Jewish people had taught the, the law and, the, and the, the religion of it so much that they would have been against him. So Jesus just did this. He knelt on the ground and began to write. 
He's in the court of the women. It's, a, it's there in the dirt, and he's, 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 riding, he's riding there in that moment. You say, what is he riding? I don't know, but I've kind of got this thought in my mind. You've heard me say it before, that Jesus, or that, excuse me, Moses in Exodus, when, when he broke the commandments, God rewrote them on tablets, and he wrote them with his own finger. And I just have in my mind that he's writing the first commandments. Love the Lord thy God, and have no other gods before me. Don't take his name in vain. Listen to me. Put him before us. Don't have any other gods. And then he said this, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And you know what those guys can say? They can look at it like, That's, I'm doing that. So you can come to church, and as long as the light doesn't shine on you, I'll be back next week. But boy, if it shines, see you in two weeks when I get over the pain of it. I don't want to be that way. I want to get up in the morning and read a large portion of God's Word in the morning and say, God, will you shine your light on this right here? And this past three weeks of my life, God has shined so much more upon my life. And I want to tell you, the more you're with the light of the world, you will never have to have people come to you. They will come, but they won't have a legitimate thing because God is the one who's shaping you. And the Bible said they just kept on, Brother Michael, didn't they? They just kept on saying to Jesus, what are you going to do? 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 And so Jesus, Jesus spoke to them. In verse 7, he who is without sin among you, be the first one to throw a stone at her. Now in this moment, I mean, you take this wrong and say that Jesus is saying nobody has the authority to judge. They jump over to Matthew 7, well, judge not lest you be judged. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying who in this crowd is living such a life that you can help this woman? See, that is what separates pastors from just anybody in the pulpit or anybody in the pew. If I do commit adultery, I should not, I've lost my right to be in this sacred desk. Now, it may be a long, I may someday be renewed by God and put back in service to Him. I don't know. But I understand my accountability. And these scribes and Pharisees, listen to me, they had lost their place of leadership. And Jesus said, if any of you are really qualified, just step up here. You take the stone. But you see, that didn't help the woman. So he knelt back down, Miss Lucy, and he wrote again. I believe he wrote this, Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt honor thy father and mother, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not covet. And the Bible says from the youngest to the oldest, they just left. That's not God's place. God doesn't want you to leave. God doesn't want you to get up and quit going to church. Many pe- I meet people every week. I want to write a book sometimes why the church is wrong. I never met a person yet that they were wrong. It's always the church, isn't it? It, it? Amen? It's always the church. I promise you, they did me wrong. They did me wrong. Well, I, I, should, I have, probably should write a book saying why I was wrong, but that's another message. So Jesus looks at the woman now. They're all gone. Holy Spirit, please guide this. Jesus stood up and said to the woman, Woman, where are they? You see, all of a sudden now, they're in the court. Of the, all these, now watch, I don't think everybody was gone. I think the ones who were accusing her were gone. And the Bible says, that, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Jesus said, no one, Lord. Kyrios is the Greek word here. It means salvation, king, leader, ruler, Lord of my life. She had been touched by God in that moment. As she looked around, now watch, there's only worshipers with her. Look around you. Look around you. So I want to ask you today, I want to ask you today to do this. I, I wrote this in the notes. Come to the light who will forever change your life. Friend, listen to me. Some of you have so much darkness that's built up inside of you that you're now convinced that your way is right. Because your mom and dad couldn't turn you. Your coach couldn't turn you. Your spouse can't turn you. As a single adult, you can't be turned. But Jesus, once again, in his great love for you, has come and he's shined his light. And he said to this woman, I don't condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You see, Jesus came so you'd be intimate with him. You say, what do you mean that you'd be intimate with him? Here's how you do it. It's coming on the screen. You need to offer him great worship. You ought to do this. You ought to offload the dark things today. I don't know what they are as it comes on the screen. Offload the dark things that have robbed you of peace. I don't know what it is. After 30 years, forgive somebody. Offload whatever it is. Maybe you need to change jobs. So you say, I, I, don't, I need to change marriage. If, I could, if my wife would just change or my husband would just change. No, 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 no. I, I want to I tell you this with all my heart. 
If God changes you, it will help to change them. And young people, some of you just need to do this. You just need to obey where He's leading. I want to tell you the path that God has is the best path. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions. And check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.